the way I look at technology now is, okay, I have this process. What's the best tool for me to make this faster or make it easier? Right. Welcome to the Financial Innovations Podcast, helping CFOs save money and time by investing in cutting edge technology. I'm your host, Daniel Bellani, and today we're really excited to introduce Viviana Zaragotia. Uh, Viviana, nice to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Looking forward to the chat. Yeah, no, this is great. So um, you have a, a very interesting role uh, where you're working in, uh, in film financing. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about um, you know, your role, what your kind of day-to-day is? Sure. So I'm Senior Vice President at TPC. Uh, we're a boutique lender working on independent film projects, financing, tax credits, and distribution contracts. So we provide production loans towards the budget and the making of the films. TPC has been around 15 years. I've been here 11. Uh, prior to that, my experience has been production accounting and finance within the film and TV realm, I started out doing production accounting at small production companies, New Image Films and Bold Films, and then segued to finance at Lionsgate, where I was there for five years. Um, so I've made my entire career in accounting and finance within the film industry. Um, I would say most of the projects we work on are the independents, meaning they raise money for financing outside of studios. Um, it's a mix of equity, debt, um, and tax credits. So there's certainly a lot to speak about to that topic. Um, and we can sort of get into that more, but that's, uh, where I sit in the, in the ecosystem. Yeah, no, that's great. I've, um, I've worked with some companies in the past that have done, you know, more, uh, production of in the music industry. And I know that from a reporting, from a, data side, it can get a little bit complex in terms of, you know, number of different, in your case, films that that you're financing versus, um, in their cases, you know, different different record labels that that they had. But, um, you know, one thing that I, I think was is interesting about how, you know, you guys are doing things is that, um, you know, you're more into Excel spreadsheets versus, you know, some of the other uh, organizations out there, are, you know, heavy into financial systems. Um, so maybe you want to tell us a little bit about like, uh, you know, what, what kinds of activities you're doing and, you know, in Excel, how you, you know, manage different, uh, you know, files and things that you have as you're, you know, sharing them across team members. Sure. So I think since I've started here, we very much have focused on using apps and technology to streamline our business. Um, I had never used Dropbox until we got here, but that's basically where we store all of our files and our data, um, which is great because I have it on my phone. So anywhere I am, if I'm having a call with someone, I can immediately pull up information on the project. Um, before we were, we're currently on Outlook, but before that we were on Gmail. Uh, but as we've grown, you know, Outlook was sort of a, a switch from a lot of employees that help streamline things. And then we use Google Sheet quite often. We have uh, about 50 employees based in different states. And we've just recently opened an office in London. So, um, you know, having still the Google platform to use, especially for Excel helps quite a lot so that we can all work on the same spreadsheets. And usually we have a couple of sheets with multiple tabs. Um, most of our work, I would say 100% of our work really is Excel based. Um, there's nothing fancier that we do in terms of modeling or tracking projects from a financial perspective that isn't on Excel. Um, we do all of the models for our prospective loans on there. Um, and sometimes we'll do alternate uh, scenarios within different tabs. So, you know, a project may have one book and we'll do, we'll use the tabs to look at different scenarios and different returns on there. Um, so I would say between Outlook, Dropbox, Google Sheet, that's, that's sort of the world that we traffic in. Um, sorry, it's sad to say we're not more sophisticated than that at this point. <laughs> it, it's, it's funny because when I started the show, I, you know, I, I built several, uh, software platforms. I have some, some patents and stuff. And I said, Oh, let's talk about financial innovation. We could talk about patents and software and all this, you know, fancy stuff that 
um, you know, makes things easier. And as we've been doing the show, you know, we've found that, you know, innovations come in all different sizes and shapes, um, you know, where uh, we started heavy on technology and we've kind of evolved to be, you know, not just technology, but ideas, processes, concepts, you know, things like that. So, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it's funny that you say that where, you know, you might feel like, hey, look, there's not a lot of innovation here because we're using uh, Excel spreadsheets. But, you know, some of the uh, most advanced things that I've seen have have come in, in the form of, you know, just a, a spreadsheet or an access database or, you know, things that like you think that are like, you know, oh, the technology's old and, you know, and uh, it's all uh, used up in terms of uh, innovative capabilities over there. Um, I know a lot of uh, companies that I work with that are, you know, heavy in the Excel world run into issues with things like version control, right? Where I know you mentioned that, you know, you have a bunch of uh, people that might be working in the same worksheet, you know, inside of a Google Sheet or an Excel file or whatever. But do you run into like situations where uh, different uh, team members might want to have their own offline copy of the uh, of the data with their own model that they're feeding in and doing, um, you know, their macros and the and the other stuff they're doing, and uh, you know, and then they're kind of reporting on data that's not, you know, the uh, the master data, if if you will, over there. Yes, um, sometimes that does happen, um, but it it's not you know a problematic as long as the final version gets added to. The Dropbox or the master, let's say Google Sheet. There are some people that you know will save. Hey, I'm going to save my own copy to my desktop. I'm going to work on this, and then once I have it to the right point, I'll bring it up to the the master one. I think that's fine, um, as long as people are being proactive and responsible in doing that in a timely fashion. Um, you know, it's okay because you know the other issue we run into is someone may be working on modeling something out. And it may not be finished and someone else will go in and, you know, accidentally use that or use it for a quote or for other means. And it may not have the accurate information on there. So to prevent that, um, I don't see a problem with someone else saving their own copy as long as the, the, the one that everyone has access to gets updated accordingly. Yeah, so it sounds like the way that you kind of manage it is if you want to pull an offline copy, pull an offline copy, but onus is on you to make sure that when this comes to the final version that you're pulling the the final numbers into your model to get that output. Yeah, I would say for me, there isn't anything that I work on that is offline. I sort of, from a high level track, a lot of our loan portfolio. And there's, again, a master Excel sheet that I use to track everything. Um, and that's saved in Dropbox for everyone's visibility. Um, but I also make it a point to constantly have accurate information on there because to the extent somebody else may be using it, I want it to be the most up-to-date version possible. Um, but again, it's, I go in there almost every day to update certain things. Um, and I, again, I haven't found an easier or more streamlined way of doing it other than that. Um, I think there is a responsibility when you are working on um, spreadsheets or whether it's whatever other type of project that is shared to keep it constantly updated because you never know what somebody else may be using it for um, in a different time zone. So the only way that these things work is if everyone agrees to abide by these sort of unspoken, unwritten rules that if there is a master sheet that everyone has access to and is sharing, then it's incumbent on you to, if it's your side of the business to update uh, f information on there that it's updated in a timely fashion. Yeah, no, that that's great. And, you know, um, we've always found that having that governance process in place, like being able to ensure that, you know, we have documentation or we have a process, whether it's written, whether it's unwritten, but making sure that, you know, our team knows that, you know, hey, look, here's here's what it is. Here's how we get accurate data. Here's how we make sure that our finished product doesn't have any, you know, gaping holes in it, anything like that, um, you know, has has really gone a long way. So it's it's great that that you mentioned that. 
Um, just want to take a, a quick second to, to our audience here just to say, um, you know, if you like uh, if, if you like the, what you're hearing, if you like the show, please make sure you like, comment, uh, subscribe to our channel to get more great guests uh, like Viviana on uh, on this channel as well. So, um, you know, th thank you for that, that input. I, I guess I just have a quick question in terms of the Excel spreadsheets that you're updating, how do you ensure that what's going into the spreadsheet, you know, is like, like what's the update process for those spreadsheets? Are you every day taking an extract from a, a system and, and putting it into the, the Excel? Like how, how are you ensuring that, um, you know, that that master sheet has the, you know, the full data that's in there? Um, I think for the one that I track, which has loan portfolio and others that other people track with more high level data, um, they go into it every day. I know I go into mine every day. And as soon as I get a piece of information that relates to something, put it in there. Um, other divisions also have their spreadsheets. Um, and it's a constantly updated, uh, process, you know, daily or every other day as you get new information. When it comes to our uh, loan proposals and quotes, you know, there is more linking going on within tabs, but there are two or three levels of review for those. So whichever one has is the most recent version. And that's usually the latest one that we use, you know, version five, six, seven, whatever it may be. Um, because once we put out a loan offer, then you're sort of dealing with the client on the terms that have been negotiated to the extent that there may be changes to the negotiation or to any of the terms. It's incumbent on whoever is managing that client to update it and see how that affects the model in general. And again, I think that's a more real time exercise than anything, because you may be on a call with a client and say, oh, we just, you know, negotiated on a fee or a, a timeline and you put it up there immediately um, so that everyone can see. So that's a pretty seamless process. I think, uh, you know, sometimes where there may be gaps, maybe you know, within different departmental information, uh, whenever the last touch point was with the client, um, sometimes there may be a lag there. Um, but again, because we know internally what everyone's doing, it's usually pretty easy to pinpoint, um, you know, when that information isn't getting updated. Okay, so there's like nothing like the hop before the Excel or Google Sheet file, like the Excel or Google Sheet file is the like origination of the the data that you guys are managing. Correct, yes, yeah. Uh, we don't pull information from an outside database to populate our Excel sheet. Um, you know, the information that we are getting, typically because we are so client focused, comes from the clients via email or call, um, and that then gets updated immediately to the Excel. Yeah, no, that that's really interesting because, you know, a lot of companies like they might have like a, a CRM, like a Salesforce or something where like they're originating we, those. Yeah, pieces. We, we've tried those in the past and right. we just haven't found one that works, to be honest. So mm -hmm. recently we've sort of been building a sort of client database via Google Sheet uh, because, again, it's immediate. Everyone can see it right away, um, you know, trying to work on a CRM. It's still something we're interested in. It just we haven't found the right way to tackle it um, yet. So we're just going back to basics with the old Excel Google Sheet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, if it if it works, you know, it, it's funny because a lot of vendors, are, oh, spreadsheets are bad. They're terrible. They have all these problems, this and that, right? But at the end of the day, if it's working for you, then uh, you know, it's not not to say that you know just put throw everything for every single process in Excel, but you, know, you have to kind of look at some of these things where, you know, to go and put a CRM in place, you might spend a million dollars going and customizing it to the level that, you know, what you need it to be. And then it becomes a matter of, well, you know, is that spend better put somewhere else? Or, you know, do we continue to, you know, customize and customize and customize till we get to something that's close, but not quite, you know, what what we want over there as well? I mean, I think eventually we will have a CRM because as we grow, we, we do see a need for it. I think the trial and error we've had in the past is sort of A, getting people to update it, um, and B, having the relevant fields and information that's useful to everyone. And what we found is that 
creating enough fields so that everyone can use it was cumbersome um, because you needed to have, I mean, we're six different divisions, you know, we manage different parts of the process. And so it just became bigger and bigger. And at some point it was like, okay, it's, it's, there wasn't any sort of um, motivation to keep it updated because it was uh, tedious. Um, so you sort of, there was this breaking point of, yes, we want all this information somewhere, um, but it's becoming a hassle and it's almost easier. Um, at least for me, uh, you know, I know what everyone does. So it's just easier for me to do a Teams chat or, you know, just ask someone, what is this information relevant to your department? And I can just use it for my purposes. Um, and sometimes that's a, a little bit easier and I think fosters more internal discussion and communication and then trying to find some database. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, you raise a lot of good points because, um, you know, a lot of companies too, they get into the mindset of like, we're just going to try to like buy technology, like just buy our way out of like issues. Right. And uh, so they go, oh, we'll buy a CRM system, put it in. Now we've got 50 people using it. And then, you know, that opens the door to other problems of, you know, um, which to me, like my big takeaway from, this conversation is communication, making sure you're staying in contact with your team and that people are knowing what's going on. Because what happens is uh, a lot of companies try to, you know, just throw technology in the mix and then, you know, take the communication out of, of it and just say, oh, we have a system for that. And then you have, you know, one person's entering, you know, Coca-Cola into their CRM and someone else is putting Coke into this, into it. And the other one is the Coca-Cola company and someone else, the Coca-Cola company limited, right? <laughs> and now you've got four different records for the same, yeah. uh, for the same company out there because you have different people who are managing different things are not, you know, talking to each other and coming up with, uh, you know, universal standards. For sure. And I, I totally agree with that. I think, you know, I'm old school and old fashioned. I'd rather just pick up the phone and ask somebody than try and spend five minutes looking in Dropbox as to where the answer may be. Um, because I value time more than anything. Um, and I think especially in our industry, I can't speak to others, but you know, film moves very fast to give you a perfect example. Just yesterday, I got a text from a client who, you know, said we need to get a term sheet right away. We got the term sheet to him in the afternoon. We had a call and. Today, we had a follow up to close the deal. So there just isn't time to put all of those notes and the evolution of the deal in a CRM per se. Um, it's just it's happening so fast in real time because as a financier for film, you're coming up against um, production deadlines, start dates, um, f you know, financial deadlines on the production when they need to hit payroll or pay other expenses that to have tried to put that all in the CRM, I think would have been inefficient and defeated the purpose of it. Um, so I, I think it's just being able to adapt your style and how you work to your industry and then also to finding a system to make sure others who are needed in the process are also involved and aware. I'm lucky that, you know, we have an office. I come here every day. My department is here. Um, and with teams, I find, you know, just letting a quick note um, helps. And I think we do a lot of weekly calls as well. And that I think helps so that everyone is up to date as to what we're currently working on and what's coming down the pipeline as well. Yeah, no, that that's great. Um, is that typical in terms of like that kind of a turnaround on, on financing of films or is it like, I mean, that's a special case. I mean, mm -hmm. I've also been talking to this client for about a month on this right. project, but you know, they're coming up against the deadline as to making a decision as to which financier they need to go to. And I knew that decision was going to be made yesterday. So, you know, that's one of those cases where you put other things on hold and you just work on that specifically. Um, so, you know, each project is different, depends on the lead time that the production gives you and when they bring you in the process. Uh, but we've certainly, I'm certainly used to working at the rhythm of the client and the tenor of you know, when they need things, because that's the competitive advantage as a financier is, you know, we often say that we pride ourselves on being nimble and responsive, efficient, streamlined, um, because we have created over the years internal processes that work for us. And the smoother the machine is internally, the more beneficial it is to the client externally. So 
you know, even though we may not have sophisticated uh, financial tools, the processes that I've outlined to you and that, again, from trial and error over the years, we found that this creates efficiencies for us to be able to pivot when a client calls right away in the situation that just happened yesterday. Right. Yeah, no, that that's great. I mean, nothing's a rush until uh, until financing needs to happen by tomorrow. Right. And then uh, everybody's uh, everybody's jumping all over it. Right. <laughs> but it's also in those moments when you realize whether your system is working or not. I right. Think. Right. Yeah. I mean, th that's the most important piece. Right. Because to your point of in some ways, you know, everyone says, oh, technology, technology makes things efficient and easy and all of that. Right. But by the time you call up the person to input the data into the system and then, you know, something wasn't entered right and they have to fix it. And you're going back and forth 50 times, you know, to go and get everything in there right. You could have lost that deal. Whereas, you know, being able to turn around, um, you know, right away, just plug it into a into a Google sheet and, you know, and, and there you go and print out the paperwork and you're done. Um, you know, it's it's being able to ensure that it's not a matter of, technology wise, you have something advanced or simple, it's a matter of, are you able to get done what you need to get done in the time that you need to get it done? Yeah. And, and I think, you know, when I first started here, we didn't have a lot of processes in place. Um, we didn't have a lot of what we now have in terms of Google Sheets and, um, you know, the sheet that I created to track the loans didn't exist either. So over the years, I sort of learned what works, what doesn't. And what relevant information was needed for all parties, um, whether that's junior, senior, or my same level of, okay, what's the data that people need on these loans? How, what's the best way for me to have that immediately at my fingertips that I can just pull up something and have it ready to speak to at any point in time? Um, and so because I manage a lot of that, uh, you know, I, I'm very much used to, I take my cues of what I need to do from the day obviously from email and external calls and other things, but, you know, every day I make it a habit to go into the portfolio and look at, okay, what, what do I need to follow up on? And I make notes for myself as well. And again, none of this is very fancy or sophisticated, but it's a system that works for me. And I think, you know, technology is a tool, but it's only as useful as the way you work, whether it fits and the way that the rhythm of your day and how you set yourself up, um, that's where you can have the technology work for you. Um, but it's not going to work if you don't have a vision in place as to how you're going to utilize it. Right. Yeah. Uh, many of our other guests that we've had on the show have highlighted, you know, people process technology and, you know, technology is always kind of last in that bucket because, you know, if you don't have the other parts there, right, then no amount of technology that you do or don't have uh, is 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 going to matter. You know, one of yeah, t technology isn't going to bring you clients, right? Right. I mean, right. Exactly. You're going to bring clients, and then you say, okay, I have the technology and the wherewithal to to use it. And I think one thing I didn't highlight, but for our loans, we use Smartsheet. So we use Smartsheet to track our closing process for our loans. And again, we used to have a Word document. Uh, that we used for many years. And then when Smartsheet came out, we said, okay, well, this is an easy tool to use, not only for us to track things, but for the client as well, because they can easily go into it, upload documents. Um, and again, it's all real time that we can update and see it. Uh, but again, that's another thing that I think a tool that has helped us manage efficiencies internally, that just makes us better at our job. Right. You brought up something that I thought it was really important and, you know, often overlooked in that when you said, hey, it's something that we can use that's easy for us to use, where a lot of companies will go and buy whatever is considered the latest, the greatest, the standard, you know, out there. Um, you know, they'll pay a lot of money to implement it. They'll pay a lot of money to get trained on it. It's something that's clunky and not easy to use. And then it gets abandoned and, um, you know, where it turns out that they've got to switch to something else because it just doesn't, you know, it's, it's not user friendly versus, um, you know, tools that they may not be the, you know, the gold standard or the name recognition in certain areas and, and all of that. But you know, if it's easy to use and it enhances the process, in many ways, it's better than the thing that does have the name recognition out there that you have to hire 20 administrators to go and, uh, and help you with every single time that, you know, you have a question. 
Yeah, it saves you on back office IT money in the long right. run. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, you know, which uh, I shouldn't be uh, saying. I should be saying, oh yeah, go buy all the fancy tools and then uh, and then hire me to go and uh, and manage it for you. But but you know, it's. Uh, um, I've had so many clients where, you know, it's been a, a vendor selection of do I buy software A or B? And, you know, B was the better one in terms of features and all of that. But I knew that A was going to be the one that would be easily adopted and one that, you know, would they be able to use themselves versus having to hire other people to go and do. And, you know, in, in, in some instances, it's better to say, hey, take the tool with less features, but it's usable and maintainable by your team versus, you know, unless you have $200,000 a year to hire, you know, people to just to, to click the buttons and make sure it works, um, you know, maybe it's better to go with less features, but, you know, something that's that's easier to use for you. I agree with that. I mean, I think the biggest lesson I've learned over the years is the easier the tools are to use, the more likely you'll get people on board to use them. Um, and if for a company you're trying to figure out what apps or what applications and what software and services I'm trying to, because ultimately it's a top-down decision, right? You're saying we're going to use this and everyone has to get on board. So the easiest way to get people on board um, is to make it user-friendly, find the ways that the technology will help them in their particular role in their department and make it easy for them to use because then they're, they're more likely to use it. Um, and that may not necessarily be the top of the line, most expensive thing. Um, but aside from knowing why you're utilizing this technology for your business, again, I go back to the people aspect of it. It's useless if people aren't using it. Right, right, exactly. You know, because a lot of companies, they'll, They'll buy the technology and then try to force the process and the people to 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 fit around the technology. And when you do that, you know, you lose a lot of uh, adoption there because now it's, uh, oh, yeah, we bought this tool, but it doesn't do this. So we have to change our process around that. And then, oh, it doesn't do that either. So we have to change, you know, before you know it, you're completely changing all the processes that took so long to, you know, maybe perfect and get right and streamlined. And now you're making inefficiencies by buying a product that's supposed to make things more efficient. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think because when I started here, just so many things didn't exist um, that we created. I, I sort of, what the way I look at technology now is, okay, I have this process. What's the best tool for me to make this faster or make it easier? So because I started in such a manual way of looking at technology and the things that we do, in a way, it's almost easier to graduate to a platform as long as it has already the manual things that I was doing. But I look at ways that I can remove the manual information and have it, you know, pop up somewhere else. So the, the transition from our closing process from a Word document to a Smartsheet was a no brainer because it created efficiencies on our side and also the client side. Uh, where they could, instead of emailing us documents, they can just upload it and we can go in and view it right away. So things like that are easy to do. And I think, you know, for the pandemic, it was very easy for us to transition to all working remotely from home because all of our files were digital anyway. And we were used to working through our computers, working on Dropbox, you know, having Dropbox on our phones. So all of a sudden to go from the abrupt change of coming into an office to working from home, it wasn't as difficult as it would have been for other companies because we were already working in that fashion with all our files visible to everyone at any time via Dropbox. Right, right. Um, the other thing that um, you mentioned this a little while uh, back, but in terms of, you know, being able to quickly turn around, you know, uh, whether it's, you know, loans, whether it's whatever it is, you know, we've talked a bit about processes, but, you know, another thing that, you know, kind of uh, comes to mind too is around the relationships that you have with the people you're working with as well, where, you know, for you to go and turn around a, a term sheet in, in a day, it's not just a everything falls on you and, and you could just click all the buttons and print it out and, and, and ship it over too, where, uh, maybe do you want to talk a little bit about like how, you know, you're able to, you know, work with others to just get 
you know, get moving quickly on, uh, on, on those types of high priority tasks? Yes. I mean, uh, you know, the way we were able to get to that point so quickly is, you know, we had already given out our, our terms and our offers. I had been working with the client to answer any questions regarding our process and how we operate. And so the, the, the data was already ready to go. It was just about creating the next step of the process, which was the term sheet. And I think, uh, you know, I think in our, in our department and the company wide, there is a very sales driven mentality that when a project comes and needs to go full speed ahead, uh, there is an understanding that other things go down the priority list and we're all hands on deck to help each other out. So it's, um, again, that's a very much culture type of mentality and thinking. Um, so it's very easy to get people on board to say, okay, we need to do this. Great. And we were in a competitive situation, uh, in, in that particular project. So, uh, and we know that we can, uh, beat our competitors in, in what we do. And so it's, um, it, you know, I think it's also for me being the lead on that particular project, you know, whatever you need, we were ready to go. And I had already sold that many times over to the client. And as soon as he said, yes, it's uh, full speed ahead. Right. You know, and, and understanding with the team that, you know, you run into the situation where uh, they're the teams where everything's a priority and top priority and high priority. And then you get them the information and it's, oh, we don't need this anymore or we need it next week or whatever, where, you know, having that relationship with the team where it's, when I say, hey, we got to turn this around in the next two hours, uh, you know, I'm not just telling you so that way I feel comfortable about, you know, having, you know, 36 hours to review it. It's a, we need this. So, it, you know, it, it's a real, uh, you know, a real emergency instead of a, an emergency. Well, you can't, you can't cry wolf, right? You can't create right. false uh, alarms and all of that. And I think when it's the client asking for something, you know, everyone understands that that's real. It's not as if I was creating that sense of urgency, the client was creating that. So everyone understands that if the client is asking for something, then yes, you prioritize that, right? Um, you know, that mandate didn't come from me. It came from the client's tenor of, if we'll do this deal, if you can get us this today, because we need to make a decision today. Um, so that's driven by the external forces. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Um, I know we're uh, we're running up on on time over here, but um, you know, any uh, this was this was great. You know, uh, I, I definitely learned a good amount from this, and I know our our audience, uh, you know, will as well over here. But uh, any other. Um, you know, recommendations, uh, words of wisdom that, that you might have for, you know, for those looking to just, um, you know, make their processes more imp uh, improvements, uh, whether it's, you know, through building better relationships with people, whether it's increased communication, whether it's processes, whether it's, you know, technology, any anything uh, like that that you can recommend? Um, you know, I think we've touched on so much, but I would say, Again, going back to I'm old fashioned, there's nothing replacing in person. Um, you know, I think we rely a lot these days on the Zooms and the Google Meets and the FaceTimes. Uh, but there's nothing like getting a feel for a person in person. Um, and so to the extent that you have the opportunity to do that, um, I always take advantage of it and I always encourage others to do so um, because communication is not just what's said, but it's also body language and the conversation can veer to other topics. Um, you know, and espe especially in this remote working culture that we're living in, I, I think there's nothing replacing the in-person uh, relationship that you develop. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Um, you know, and uh, definitely, like I said before, you know, a lot of takeaways from, uh, from, from talking to you here. So really appreciate uh, you being on the show, you know, once again, for those watching, you know, make sure you subscribe to the show. Um, so that way we can get more great guests just like Viviana on this as, as well. Viviana, it was a pleasure having you on. And, you know, we look forward to uh, hearing updates from you in the future in terms of, uh, you know, other other initiatives and, and things that, that you may be involved in. Great. Thank you so much for having me. This has been really fun. Um, I don't often get to talk about these topics. So I appreciate the forum. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely.